You're listening to the Mind Your Business Podcast, episode number 42. Today, we're talking to a very special guest about how to develop a customer-centric mindset. So, stay tuned. Hi, I'm James Wedmore, and I've built a seven-figure internet business that offers the financial freedom to do what I want, when I want. And I'm the first to say that hard work and hustle are not essential ingredients for your success. So how do you build a thriving business from the inside out? This is the Mind Your Business podcast featuring myself and co-host Phoebe Morocek. All right. Hello, listeners. James Wedmore here. And I'm Phoebe Morocek. And welcome to the show. I'm excited. This is a really, really good episode. I think people will really like this one. We had a guest. We haven't had too many guests on for a while, so it was good to, you know, Phoebe hogs the mic the whole time. <laughs> I listen to myself on our episodes. I'm like, oh my gosh, just shut up for a second, James. Jeez. I, not, welcome to my brain. <laughs> oh, <laughs> come on. Jeez. Just... I give you an inch and you just take a mile. <laughs> Unbelievable. So listen, Jason Friedman, great friend of mine. We are in a mastermind together and we just finished it up. So we kind of get to recap it for a moment and get you pumped up for the episode. You know, it goes off a little from our usual track, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, we like to take you down the rabbit hole. We talk about things like mindset, spirituality, manifesting, emotions, confidence, fear. And this is in the mindset realm, but it's a little different than that. And it's something that I had to adopt. Phoebe, I'm sure you had to adopt it. Definitely. And every one of our listeners, if you own a business, if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to have to adopt this as well. Because what I have seen since the dawn of, I wanted to say time, but my entrepreneurial journey is these two camps of people who are, and I think I mentioned this in the podcast, but two camps of people that are like really pushing and striving. They're coming from this energy of desperation. Like, please, somebody buy my stuff. I'm just trying to make this work. And you can tell, you can feel it. And it's just repulsive. It it just, you know, repels you from that. I think we all have an example of someone we've seen do that. And then there's these other people that it's just like everything they do, like everything they touch turns to gold Mm -hmm. and you just can't get enough of them. And so what Jason is offering here in this episode is that this is about a shift in mindset where your dominant mindset becomes that of a customer-centric one, where it is everything is about the customer first. And this is a paradigm shift in your thinking. I love it. So he takes us through some examples, some exercises, some specific action items, you know, and a lot of good stuff like that. Was there something that was like really stood out to you, Phoebe, that you really enjoyed? Yeah, I like, he calls it a moment of wow. And he talks about how creating this experience of it's almost like planned spontaneity. So I won't say too much about it, but it was just in that conversation that I thought of a million different ideas. And as he was speaking, I was writing things down that opportunities that maybe I hadn't seen that I could really just plan it. But for your customers, it comes across like, wow, I hadn't, you know, I really didn't expect that. So look out for that piece of information that he goes through, because I do like the exercises he takes you through or takes us through. And I feel like this is a really valuable topic for people that have their own business or if you're even in a business, like how can you create these great expectations, you know, great book, by the way. those expectations and then create those moments of wow to, you know, kind of over deliver. Yeah. And, you know, I just look at this podcast, which we can say we started as a passion project, but we really started from a place of wanting to serve of eight years of seeing well, no matter what strategy, tip, or action item I've given, there are people that struggle and can't take the right actions or they freak out or they get nervous or it just doesn't work. And really, if you look at this podcast, we've had so much extraordinary feedback. Thank you for all the feedback. There's no monetary thing for this. Like We're not selling anything right now. There's no like, oh, here's the end game. Here's how we're trying to make all this money from it. It's come from this place of you know, every episode is like, what's the transformation we can make? What's the impact we can create for people in this episode? And I think that's what Jason is really going to give you a framework for is starting with the end in mind of the customer first. So I just think it's so, so important. Without further ado, let's get into Jason's bio, shall we? Of course. So Jason is the founder and CEO of CX Formula, a company that helps other entrepreneurial companies design what he calls their customer experience journey, which is a unique process 
to turn customers into raving fans. He's worked with solopreneurs and Fortune 100 companies, companies that you would know like Foot Locker, Adidas, Nike, Disney, a whole range of different companies. And we're just so pleased, honored to have Jason on the show. So should we jump into the episode? Yeah, let's roll that interview. All right. Welcome to the show. James Wedmore here. And I'm Phoebe Morocek. And we've got a special guest, Jason sure. Friedman. Jason, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm really uh, excited to be here. I'm really happy to have you on the show. So first and foremost, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to hang out with us today. Let me see if I can do my best to set the stage and create some context for what we're going to discuss today. Because, you know, we like to take people down the route of a lot of mindset of being an entrepreneur and a business owner. And Jason's really here to start a conversation into something where he strung some words together beautifully that I just love, which is creating a customer centric mindset. And for years, something that I noticed in the marketplace, I still notice to this day, especially on places like Facebook and social media. And I feel like other people notice it. They just, maybe they're just not saying it is that we can draw this line, this, you know, not to make everything black or white, but create this distinction between two types of business owners and online entrepreneurs, those that are of this like giving abundance, just wealth of overflowing knowledge and value and goodness. And it's like, that's who they are. And that's what they would do even if they weren't making any money. And then there's this other group of people that I see that I feel like it's like this painful desperation of they're just trying to get something to work by give me, give me, give me. And like, you know, and there's like, there's this push for their stuff, but it's out of this sense of desperation. And I don't know if either of you guys have really seen that, but that's, I mean, yeah, that's something I've noticed. And I feel like that's what people are trying to do, right? Is that they are jumping into a business to say, let me see if this can work. Let me see if I can get some results and then maybe we'll turn this into something real. And I'm hoping here today that Jason, Phoebe, and I will create a conversation that can kind of flip that on its head because I just love this. So does that sound like we're setting the stage right for the direction, Jason? I'm excited to hear what happens today from that. So that (laughs) sounds awesome. (laughs) Good. Well, let's start at the beginning because I know you have a very interesting background in this. So I'd love if you could just take a moment and share a little bit of your story. Sure. You know, I started out as a theater person and I was actually a behind the scenes guy. I was a lighting designer and a technician. And I spent most of my early years traveling on the road. I was a rock and roll roadie for a bunch of different groups like Rush, um, Fleetwood Mac. And then I went on to do a bunch of Broadway tours with Man of La Mancha, Jesus Christ Superstar and, and a variety of others. And I spent most of those years like really understanding audience on a whole different level and understanding your customers. And everything that we did was to add value to the customers. And if there was anything that was even a remote distraction, we would take it away. Mm -hmm. So I learned that kind of over many, many years accidentally. I didn't even realize I understood that. And one of the things that I started being able to do as I started my first business was to create a lot of simplicity and clarity for my customers because I innately focused on them. Like I had this mindset about really deeply understanding my customers, understanding what their needs were, where they were, and what was important to them. And all of our energy went there. And really amazing things came out of that. So it came out of that world of theater and that whole experience of the performing arts and tying that to business where all this kind of magical stuff bubbled out of. I love it. So what is the result of coming from that perspective, do you think? Well, there's some great research out there. And one of the statistics that I share a lot is a study by Bain and Company. And they went out and they surveyed companies and customers. And they found that 80% of the CEOs of businesses out there believed that they were creating this amazing experience, this amazing value for their customers. And when they surveyed the exact same customers of those companies, they found that only 8% of those people agreed with that. So there's this huge divide, and I call that the the experience gap. And it's this belief that as a business, as a company, we have this understanding and this feeling that we're doing such a great job. We're really delivering and firing on all cylinders with our customers, and we don't even know it, but most of our customers don't feel that way. They don't feel supported. They don't feel cared for. They don't feel that the company really, it matters, that the customers matter to the company. And a lot of the saddest part about that is 
most of those customers that are unhappy or dissatisfied or planning their exit from the relationship, it's quiet. You don't even know as the business. So all of this is happening kind of behind the scenes and you're thinking everything's good and you wake up one day and you start seeing that you're losing customers. You're losing all these relationships that you spend so much money and you know, cost of customer acquisition, as you know, is such a big thing. What does it cost to get a customer? And these businesses are just losing it. So I think the result of not focusing on the value that you create, not having that customer-centric mindset is so huge. And it's such a problem today more than ever before. You yeah. know, the internet, as we all know, is this like amazing tool, this amazing opportunity, but it's created the world's largest megaphone. <laughs> yes. Anybody, right? Yeah. So any customer, any person that's got an opinion, has got a feeling about something, is able to broadcast it to hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of people instantly. Let me ask you something just out of curiosity. Do you feel like it's gone too far in a way? Like, do you feel like there's a limit? You know, I even find myself sometimes when I have a bad experience and bad experiences happen all the time. It's just a part of life where I start feeling a little self-righteous. Like I want (laughs) to take down the company on social media type thing. And I stop myself and I'm like, you know what? I wouldn't really want anybody to do that to me. Like, do you feel like it's gotten out of hand? Do you feel like there's some stuff that we just kind of have to ignore? I know businesses that hate Yelp because one little thing goes wrong like they type in their shipping address wrong so the package doesn't arrive and now they want to give them a (laughs) one-star rating yeah like what's your opinion on that just out of curiosity i mean i share your opinion from a business owner perspective it's like as i feel that frustration myself as a consumer i think oh well what would happen if that came to my business and it kind of tempers that emotional reaction yeah but i don't think that's true for the vast majority of the population no it's not (laughs) And, and as a business owner, you know, we're all entrepreneurs and we're looking at how to create that value. We have to put our consumer hat on. And one of the most important things I talk to people about all the time is literally stepping into the shoes of your customer, putting on their glasses, looking through their lenses and looking at it that way. And this is a perfect example. If you think about it from the consumer perspective, what happens when someone just maybe ships something and they have an address wrong. Maybe they put the wrong suite number and it went to your neighbor instead of you, but you didn't know for two days. Mm-hmm. And you get so angry and so emotionally kind of freaked out. You know, you start to think, oh, what am I going to do? This is horrible. They don't care. And that reaction, we all have it, right? It's a human nature reaction. And so as a business, those like little things, you got to be paying attention to them. You have to understand what it's like for that customer and what are they feeling yeah. And the thing that most people miss is understanding it from that perspective of the customer. I was on a phone call earlier today with a business that we're consulting with and I'm coaching them. And, you know, they were talking about all these different problems that they have and they all come from the fact that they're not looking at the customer's needs and wants and thoughts. And as they're explaining all these problems, because I'm not so close to it, you know, I'm outside, you're listening to this and you're hearing, oh my God, you're not doing anything for your customer. You're forcing the business's goals and the business's objectives on the customer. So one example that they gave was we had to recognize revenue sooner. So we started forcing our customers to take delivery before they were ready for a product. Mm. Right. And that makes sense. On the one hand, you think from the business perspective, look, we got to get our revenues in, we need to make payroll, we need to be able to support our customers. But then in order to do that and meet those needs of the business, you're shoving stuff down the throat of the customer and they're getting stuff earlier than they needed to. Then they're feeling the pressure of paying you faster. And all of a sudden, you had a customer that was excited about working with you that really wanted to get into a relationship. And now you started to really push and put them into this box where they're being reactionary and reactive to what they thought was going to be a wonderful experience. Now they're already off put you know, from the very beginning. And I just think that happens all the time. And the reaction, especially in the consumer marketplace, is they go to the Internet. They start complaining. They put negative reviews and they stop buying from you. Yeah. And so there's a way to solve that. Well, I want to ask and I just want to be a devil's advocate for a moment. I'm trying to put myself in a listener's shoes, you know, because I think we can all agree that we've had experiences with bad Customers, you know, what we, I don't want to even use the word bad, but we've had bad experiences with a customer. I'm not trying to say anybody's bad, but in, sure. it's, it's an unwanted experience with a customer. Is there a line, though, a boundary to where like that whole concept that we've all, you know, I think 
have heard for years, which is the customer is always right. Like, is there a line where? The- yeah, I, I don't think the customer is always right. I think the customer is not always right, mm-hmm. but there has to be an alignment with the business and the customer, and there has to be a very clear set of expectations that are created and that are put forth. And the more that you can understand your customer from the very beginning, the more you're going to attract the right fit customers right. versus the wrong fit customers. This is good because I, before we get into some of the stuff, like you mentioned some great things like this gap. So how do we really find what the customer wants? I think I want to play here for a second. You know, how do you set those expectations and where is that line for like, what can we offer our listeners in terms of, you know, setting those, your own boundaries and stuff, you know, like, have you ever had to fire a client or a customer? And I know I have, it's tough and you don't want to put it into a world of right or wrong or I'm right, he's wrong, stuff like that. But what type of advice do you have for setting that up so that you can have the expectations and not be ignorant to the customer's needs. You know what, do you understand what I'm asking? Totally, totally, totally. And I will say uh, I've had to fire customers in the past and while it's most of the time felt to be very liberating, when you go back and you look at some of those situations, you really understand. I mean, we try and do a postmortem of all of those kinds of things and really look at what caused this to go really well, what caused us to not go really well and understand all of the intricacies of those relationships. And when you start to see a pattern you should say, well, maybe this wasn't set up right from the beginning. Maybe this is not a wrong fit customer. Maybe there's some steps in our process that are not creating alignment. And I think a lot of times that might be the case with businesses. It's not to say that you're always going to attract the right customers. You have to be really specific and put it together the right way. But what I think you need to do is I think you really, you know, there's this idea of the avatar, right? You know, Mm -hmm. who is your avatar? Who's your ideal avatar? And I like to think of it a little differently than that. I like to think of it as a customer persona, And I like it just because it makes you, it kind of reminds me that it's a person, right? Versus this weird icon out there or something like that from the gaming world. And really understand who these people are. Your customers a lot of times become, you know, just a list of people in your email system or or a bunch of numbers on a spreadsheet. But really understanding who these people are and getting really clear on what their goals are, what their frustrations are, what their needs are, and what their wants and desires are. And so when we start to understand customers on a much deeper level, we're able to really create value. We can actually reverse engineer the entire journey that customers go on with our business. Mm. And when we do that, it's by, I call it like designing your customer experience by design versus what most businesses do is with their experiences by default, Yeah, right? It's just what happens. We just kind of let it go. And you can literally design every touch point of your journey intentionally to get to that end result that you want for your customer. And the results of that are insane. I mean, you talk about creating word of mouth. You can literally script the reaction that your customers would have, the things that they'll say to their friends and to other people from a referral standpoint, and then you can reverse engineer the journey that will compel them to say those exact words. And it comes from creating that customer persona and really understanding the nuances of who your customers are, what their needs are, what they're thinking, feeling, and expecting, things I, like that. I love that. And it's, it just changes the game dramatically when you do that. And on the inside of your company, when you start to understand your customers as like these true people, you'll see that it falls into some categories. You end up with these key customer persona. You might have four you know, in your business. You might have different products and services in your business. So you might have different customer personas for different products or different services or different aspects of your business. But once you understand them and your team understands them, it's so much easier to deliver on their expectations and meet their expectations. The attitude that comes back to you is transformational for your whole employee experience as well. Yeah, this is fantastic. And I want to go back because you, you know, you're using those words like you got to understand them. And I think that's so powerful. And I think eight years of running my business, that's a discipline I'm still doing constantly. And you mentioned this gap that most businesses have where they think they're having this you know, delivering this customer experience, but they're totally not. What are some best practices or simple things that we could do right now to understand what our customer really wants? That's a great question. Uh, one, of the, one of the techniques that I like to use was actually invented in the early 1900s by a guy by the name of Konstantin Stanislavski. And you may have heard of him. He's a famous Russian theater director and actor. And he came up with this whole process to help actors be more believable on stage. 
right? And so he went to the theater and would see an actor playing a role and thought, well, that's fake. I don't believe that you're really that person on stage. And so he would use an example, like if you had someone that was on stage in a role of a terminally ill patient, so they were in the hospital and they were going to die, that person that was portraying that role had to get into character to be able to really make that believable. They had to understand what was happening in the world in the mind of someone that was not going to, that was facing the end of their life, that was not going to live. And to do that, they had to really go through a lot of research and a lot of effort. And so he came up with this program, this process to teach them how to do it. And he did this role playing and he had this idea called this magic if, right? And so he would say to the actor, you have to understand your character on such a deep level. You have to be able to put yourself in these hypothetical scenarios. So you'd have to say like, if I was going to be in a hospital bed and if I was having, I was terminally ill, what would I be thinking? What would I be feeling? What would my biggest concern at that moment be? And really step inside that character and start to play with that. And I think that kind of of an idea of how to really get inside the head of our customers, like when they find out about you, where are they? Are they in their car? Are they listening to a podcast while they're driving? Are they sitting in their office? Are there other distractions? Like understanding the things that are going on in the world of your customer when they're interacting with your brand are really important. Mm -hmm. And understanding, you know, what it is that they're looking for is really important. So to get into that place to understand your customers, you have to do those kinds of exercises. One of the best things I ever did with one of my businesses is I actually had all of my employees take an improv acting class because, A, it was a lot of fun, but everybody learned how to listen better and they started to be able to do these like role-playing scenarios. And so what we started doing in our business is we would actually give them some specific instances of customer situations and we get people in our company to start acting out those situations. So someone just bought a product and it was broken and it didn't work. Now go, like what's going to happen? And they would role play all these scenarios. And from that, we got real clarity around the kinds of things that people were feeling, the frustrations, and our team started to understand them. Wow. So it's that customer centric thinking, like having the mindset of the customer, what is happening in their world? Forget the fact that you have to take a return back and forget all that. What is it doing to them? Like if the product that they just bought is not working, what does that mean? What is that stopping them from doing? What extra time are they spending to fix the problem? Yeah, you may give them a free product or give them some kind of gift certificate, but the fact that they had to stop time in their life and not focus on what they needed or what they were looking for becomes such a distraction. And that's like we were talking about those frustrations before where people want to start telling other people. Those moments really make a big deal, you know? And so it's so important if you start to role play and understand that what's happening in the customer's mind and you can get that level of clarity and you can do it with your team, then you'll be able to start to think more clearly about all the systems and processes or the steps that you do in your business. And you'll be able to really see, well, why this may or may not make sense from that customer's point of view. Does that make sense? It totally does. And I want to put you on the spot and ask you something. I was at an event that we were hosting yesterday, a little workshop. And, you know, I love these opportunities where, I get to meet one of my customers in person. There was someone there who'd been following me for three years and listened to every episode of my podcast and all my YouTube videos. You know, I, I just like, I geek out so much about wanting to learn so much about who my biggest fans are. Sure. What is one question that I could have asked her to just understand her even more? Ooh, that's a really good question. Yeah. As an internet marketer, right, you know, you spend a lot of time online and putting out products and doing surveys and asking questions. I think you probably have more knowledge than most people, James, just knowing you, you know. Yeah. But I think most people don't have some basic information on, like, their customers. So I think the most important question I would ask most people is, what is the most impactful thing or, you know, what is the thing that stands out most for you about all the content you viewed from me, all the interactions you've had with me that has really impacted your life and changed your life in some way and how. I love like, that. What has it done for you, right? Because I think as an entrepreneur, I mean, my motivation as an entrepreneur is to create more contribution, to help other people, to make the world a better place. And then hopefully money will come from that, right? It's not the focus for me. It's about that contribution. And I think for most entrepreneurs, when you can start to understand how your work 
or your products or your services are impacting others and how they're utilizing them, the insights that come from that are so huge. More often than not, things that my customers have told me about the process of working with me have been opening my eyes to something that I've taken for granted Mm. or something that I didn't even understand was happening. And once they kind of illuminated that for me, I was able to do more of it and have that impact on more people, right? right? Because I was intentional. That's the whole idea of by design versus by default. So I am intentional in almost everything that I do with clients and employees and team members, but there's a lot of strategic byproducts and other wonderful things that come out of those relationships that really move and impact people that if we don't ask some of those questions, that what we know about it, we can leverage that to help more people. What if we are talking about people who haven't necessarily built a seven-figure business and we're actually bringing it back to people who maybe have a couple hundred people on their email list and you know maybe they have yet to sell a product or they've sold one and had a few sales. What process would you put in place to kind of prevent like this huge gap that we're talking about? You know, is there a process or, you know, would it be a survey or getting on the phone? How would you first, what would that look like? What questions would you be asking from the beginning? And then what is the best, I guess, method of, I guess, getting that feedback from your customers? Sure. Awesome question, Phoebe. So I think, you know, the key to any kind of, you know, customer centric journey is beginning with the end in mind. You always want to start at the end and say, you know, what do we want to the, the outcome of this relationship to be? What do we want the outcome of this journey to be? Where do we want the customer to be after we've interacted with them? When you can get super clear on what that wants to be for the customer, then you can go back and look at your email sequences or the lead magnets you deliver or the video content that you're creating or the blog posts that you're putting out. If you really look at the journey and where you want to go, you know, it's like getting on an airplane. The airplane ride can be great. There's a lot of wonderful things that can happen on the plane, but first you have to know where the plane's heading, mm-hmm. right? So we really want, if you're starting out, that's an even better place to be sometimes than if you've got a big, big business because there's less, you know, fixed objects in place that you have to move. So if you're just starting out, you don't have a huge list. That's great. You still need to start out by understanding who your core customers are, who are those customer personas, and then look at where do you want that relationship to go? Where If in an ideal world, at the end of this experience that you're going through, whether it be just reading a blog post or going through a launch sequence or anything like that, what do you want them to tell other people about how they felt going through that process? And when you can get real specific and put lots of great adjectives and paint a very clear picture, then reverse engineering that journey and figuring out all the different steps that you have to bring them on is a whole lot easier. Mm -hmm. And the key is looking at how people feel at Mm -hmm. each step. And it's really important. So we do a a whole workshop called Customer Journey Mapping. And what we look at is a bunch of key things. We look at what is a customer doing at each interaction? What are they thinking? What are they expecting? What are they using? And how are they feeling? We look at those five key elements. And by doing that for each of the steps of the interaction points on their journey with us, we're able to literally engineer what happens so that we can make sure that they get to that end result that we set out for them, right? And we do that by being in their, you know, in their head, in their, in that customer mindset. So this is awesome, and I'd love to, in a moment, start switching into some of the action items and specifics that we can do to become more customer centric and improve that experience and intentionally create, like you said, by design that it intended feelings and emotions and experiences. I'm wondering first, Jason, out of curiosity, do you have any story, any experience in your life where you were had a poor experience with another business and they were able to turn it around for you and like save you as a customer? Yeah. I, I, listen, there's no such thing as the perfect experience. There's no such thing as the perfect relationship or anything. I think it's how people handle situations and how they mm-hmm. deal with it. And I think... One of the key things for me, I've had a bunch of experiences that have been less than what I expected or would have desired. I'm sure you have as well. I mean, it happens to all of us all the time. When I know that it's not intentional, when I know that you know things happen, but when the company deals with it in a way that makes me feel really good, those are the moments that make me say, yeah, this is a relationship I do want to have. Something was broken. It wasn't great. One of the best examples for me was at a hotel chain. Uh, I'd gone on a vacation with my family 
And it was a comedy of errors. You know, we got to the resort. and This was on another country. So you had international travel. I had two small children with me. We get there and they have no record of our reservation. Mm. Right. And we had the confirmations. They had mailed us like a big packet. You know, they tried to rate a great experience. They sent us a big box with like, congratulations. Welcome to, you know, you're so great that you're coming. And that was step one. And then they told us that they were sold out. And they didn't know what they were going to do. And they were being very transparent with all the problems, but it wasn't helping us. Like we were stranded now on an island and had no place to stay. Wow. You know, so it was one of those. What ended up happening, you know, in short was, you know, they ended up renting a house for us on the island and got us there for the first two nights. And then they brought us back once they had rooms there. They did a lot of things to show how much they did care and ultimately explained to us what went wrong. Mm. Like they told us why it happened. They fell on their sword and apologized, but it all made sense to us. So not only did they, you know, a lot of places will just, oh, we'll give you a free thing. Like a hotel will be like, oh, we'll comp you on your next night. Well, these people actually did everything that they could have. They put us in a beautiful place. They had everything taken care of for us. They gave us a bunch of money back. I mean, but they also explained why. And they yeah. showed us what happened. And they said, like, we really want you to understand this is not what happens. This is like a complete fluke. And we also see why it happened. And we're not going to let that happen again. Mm-hmm. So I believe them. There was enough transparency. And they really showed how much they cared. And they said to us, like, you know, we want to make sure that this doesn't upset you or hurt you. Obviously, it already did. But we want to make sure that you're OK. So they really understood what was happening for us at that moment. And they did a great job. It's so funny, Jason. I had a very similar experience where I show up to a hotel and they like, we have no record of your reservation and we're close. Long story short, they had misspelled my name in the reservation. So they put me under Redmore with an R. And when it was finally figured out, there was a note in the room with like a bottle of champagne and chocolate covered strawberries for Chelsea and I. They made a joke out of it. They're like, dear Mr. Read more. We are extremely sorry for the inconvenience. And I'm like, I just loved that, you know, because everything worked out that we could all laugh about it. And that was absolutely, I was really cool. So I'd love if we could transition into any to do's, action items. What can we start doing to improve the customer experience and really facilitate those feelings and emotions that we want to create for our customers? Sure. So one of the mistakes a lot of people make is they think that you have to over deliver all the time. Right. So, oh, let's, you know, set the bar low and over deliver or under promise and over deliver. I'm sure you've heard that before. Yeah. And one of the problems with, you know, kind of chronic over delivery is that it just becomes delivery. It becomes the expectation that you're going to always raise the bar and you're always going to over deliver. So one of the most important things and where the value really lies is in meeting the client's expectations, just meeting them where they're expecting you to be. And so it's about, again, first getting really clear about what your customer's needs are, getting clear on the customer persona, but then setting those expectations, you know, putting them down, writing them down and articulating them to the customers and then simply meeting them, putting in whatever system or process or things backstage behind the scenes on your business side that have to be done that will ensure that you meet those expectations. That's the first thing that you really want to do. And then the next thing that you need to think about is how can you create some moments of wow, right? And so that's where we're going to do some over-delivery. But we're going to do that in a way that doesn't create an expectation of it, an anticipation of it. The way I define wow is it's surprise of an elevated magnitude, right? So there has to be this moment of surprise. And I have this idea, I call it planned spontaneity. And it means it's completely planned out for you. So you sit down, you figure out all these things you're going to do. But for the receiver, the customer, it's like a surprise. It's spontaneous. So years ago, I used to sit down on New Year's Day and I did this for my spouse. And I would sit down and I would come up with six or seven things that I would do for her that were going to be just awesome. Just maybe I would be sending her flowers. I'd make reservations for a dinner someplace. I'd take her to a show, whatever those were going to be. And I would schedule them on my calendar. And the key was that those moments were completely unexpected. They weren't on a birthday or an anniversary or Valentine's Day. They were just on a Tuesday, just because. And so once I did those different things, I put them on my calendar and then they just kind of happened. I had my assistant work through that or I I scheduled it and what have you. And the reaction from each of those things that just kind of randomly happened throughout the year that were tailored to what her goals were, what her needs were, what her desires were, resulted in a a very happy spouse. 
right? As you can imagine. Yes. And so I started taking that exact same concept into my business and teaching it to my clients. And so what I would suggest you do is you take your key relationships, personal or business, whatever, and sit down and after having gone through that persona exercise, think of what are some really wonderful things that you could do that would surprise and delight them. And then how can you build them into some sort of a sequence that's spontaneous for them? They have no idea it's happening, but when it does, it creates that wow moment for them that is – it's just beautiful. The gratitude that they feel for you and for your business and the reciprocity that comes out of that is tremendous. They tell other people about it. They share those stories. They get really excited about that relationship I and that. it's such an important thing. So I think – if I was to suggest, you know, kind of two things, I would do that customer persona exercise, really think about those customers deeply, and then look at how I make sure that this touch points in my experience were really dialed in, and then I added some moments of wow. You know, oh, Phoebe, I, I was going to bring it to you, Phoebe, actually, and say I think it'd be great if you shared what we did along this line for our inner circle members, our mastermind that we run. As soon as they joined, we, you know, at the start of the year, we gave them a gift. If you want to talk about that, Phoebes. Yeah. So we had the moleskin journals made with their names engraved in it. That was just, I think it went above and beyond what they were expecting, obviously. And so it created that moment of wow that you're talking about. And then throughout the year, James or myself have been writing them handwritten letters that get delivered to their house just about things that are happening in their businesses that, and we make a point to acknowledge certain things that they're doing or that they've done for other people for their, like in their business. And I think that that from what I've gotten back from the feedback has just been, I think taking it to a different level and really kind of strengthening our relationship as a group individually and has really created a great experience, I think for them from the feedback. But I do have one question for you, Jason, and this kind of goes away from you know, the mastermind model. But for example, James's membership site that I helped to run is Real Marketing Insider. And we have thousands of members in there. And so my question is, when we're looking at creating those wow moments, I see how, you know, James and I have done it in our mastermind and how we've been able to create that experience for that one on one client. But how do you create that, you know, to scale, I guess? That's a great, great, great question. Yeah. And there's a concept called mass customization. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. I actually have a download that you guys can share with your audience if you'd like afterwards that has some of this stuff in there. But there's this idea of mass customization. It's how do you create a very custom tailored experience for a larger group so that it doesn't take, you know, I mean, your arm would fall off by writing a million of those thank you notes, right? We've done but that. How can you <laughs> use this idea? And there's a bunch of different ways to adapt an experience to a larger audience so that you can have a consistent process and a, I guess, a cost-effective means to implement that and yet still have it feel very tailored to that group or to that person. So I have a little bit more about that. I, I think maybe download that. I'll share that link with you in a bit. But that would be really helpful for people to kind of think about that when you're trying to do it in mass. The thing that you said that is so key, Phoebe, is – People want to feel like you care about them. They want to feel cared for. They want to feel known and understood. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's that great copywriter line of, you know, you want to enter the conversation that's already happening in the customer's mind. Mm -hmm. And there's an even better one that, you know, Ray Edwards, great copywriter, James, you know, Ray well. I love it, um, Ray. Yeah. yeah, I love Ray. He's awesome. You know, Ray was saying, you know, if you can explain what's happening in your customer's world and put it into words better than they can say it themselves, like you got them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when we're thinking about this customer centric mindset and really thinking about the customers, like if you can deliver that value, if you're watching them in your mastermind or you're interacting with people on your website or seeing surveys and things come through, you're getting so much insight into what they care about, what they need, and also what their love language is. Like what is it that matters to them, right? So some customers are going to love when you send them something. Other customers are going to love when you know, it's sending something physical. They want a gift. Another customer is just going to be excited when you call them out on your podcast and mm -hmm. they feel like you've recognized them. Mm -hmm. Another customer is going to be really excited when you've, you know, they've sent in some stuff and you just created a bit of content that scratches the itch for the problem that they've had. So, you know, understanding where they're at and what's important to them and what their needs are at that level, you can really touch on that and make them feel really great. Mm -hmm. uh, do I have time for a very quick story? Please. James? Yes. So I was working with a restaurant many years ago now. It's probably like six or seven years ago now, but they were floundering. If you know anything about the restaurant business, which I think you have a little bit of experience, 
in your past life, but you know, it's about how many turns of your tables you have per night. Mm-hmm. And these guys had about 30 tables in their restaurant and they only had about a quarter to a half of them ever filled and they only got like one to one and a quarter turns. So they were basically bankrupt and they were struggling and they had good food and they, you know, it was okay, but they weren't able to make ends meet. The problem is that they weren't focusing on their customer. And we went in and we started talking to their customers about like, why are you not coming back? And it was just like, well, it's like nobody seems to care about us. And I think that's true of like most restaurants now when you go there, it's just they're there, they're putting out food on the tables, they're running around, but they don't really care about you. And so we needed to help them fix this. And we needed to do it for no money. They had no budget. And it's important to note, like, you can do a lot of wonderful things for your customers, and it doesn't have to cost you a cent. And so what we did was we came up with a strategy. They were like a local restaurant. They wanted to be known for just some good, fine home cooking. They wanted families to come out for dinner and local businesses to come there for lunch. And so we came up with this concept of your dinner table away from home. And so we wanted them to have everyone to feel that this was your dinner table away from home. You can come here and have a nice home-cooked meal. We're going to take good care of you. It's going to be casual and, and comfy and such. And it was based on the old television show Cheers. If you remember Norm, you know, he'd walk in. Everyone knew his name and everyone was kind of happy and, and connected. And so the way that we did this, started to get customers to feel cared for, was very simple. When a customer would come in, the hostess would greet them and would ask a simple question is this your first time dining with us? And if you said yes, the hostess would turn around behind her and grab a set of silverware wrapped in, you know, bundled silverware wrapped in napkins that were white if this was your first time. And if you said, no, I've been here before, they would grab a bundle of silverware wrapped in a red napkin, red for return. So they'd bring you to your table, they'd sit you down, and then as you're sitting there looking at the menu, a bunch of the employees in the restaurant would come around and if they saw white napkins, they would say, oh, welcome, we're so glad to have you here, so on and so forth. If you had red napkins, different members of the restaurant team would come by and say, oh, my gosh, it's so great to have you back again. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. All of a sudden, they're seeing like, oh, my God, like these people know us. This is cool. And so then the waitress would come over and say, you know, we're so glad to have you. If you're new, she'd say, here's a couple of my favorite things on the menu. As a first timer, our chef would like to bring you a special appetizer. So do you have any food allergies or is there anything that you guys are sensitive to? Great. I'm going to bring you something special over. Mm -hmm. And as they would go through the meal, the service level was really high. Understanding what their needs were at every moment was really high. But just having them feel cared for. And at the end of the night, the waiter would say, you know, I'm so glad that you came. I just want you to think about this place as your dinner table away from home. So anytime you want to come back, ask for me. I'm Susan. Uh, you know, this is my section. You know, please ask to be, you know, this, to be seated in my section. I would love to have you back. And I hope I see you again real soon. I love it. These people just started coming back. It builds loyalty. Yeah. And then, you know, like you said, you know, we started to know more about them. The waiters and waitresses would start to jot down little notes about the customers that were coming back more and more. And we would start to be able to tailor it each time. So they would know what their favorite drink was. They, you know, we would do something randomly out of nowhere. We would just buy one of the tables a free dinner. Mm. Just little things, you know, mm. and it doesn't need and even buying them a dinner wasn't necessary. It was just another nice thing to do. But simply doing the napkin trick, I call it the napkin trick, you know, yeah. a white and a red napkin. It didn't cost them a nickel. We had to teach their staff how to react to that. That was it. I'm and curious because so, I know so many restaurants that ask me if this is my first time there or not. I'm one, I always wonder, are they doing something with that information or is it, you know, does it stop there? And I had no idea. I wouldn't even have known to look for to see if someone's giving me some sort of, you know, different colored napkin to... But yeah, I, you always hear that question. You want to go someplace where people know you, where they recognize you, yeah. where you know you feel important, you know, and totally. that's the whole nature. So it's about thinking that way for your customers. How do you make them feel like the star? How do you make them feel like the hero, and you're the guide that takes them on that journey? Yeah, Jason, this has been so awesome, and thank you, thank you for coming on and spending the time sharing this. You guys, I just think this is so powerful because so many people that I see are approaching their business from, well, let me see what results I can get, or let me make this work, or how can I do this? How can I do that? And we kind of ignore that the results that we're getting are coming from the customers that we are serving, and we can either serve them poorly or really well. And I think if we start there, which is what Jason is saying, and I think Phoebe and I truly agree with that, if we start with the intention of how can we better serve our customers, you know, 
word of mouth marketing, still the most effective marketing. The rest kind of can start to take care of itself. So Jason, where do we go now? Where can we learn more about you? What's the next step? I have a download called Seven Customer Experience Killers, which helps you go through a bunch of key mistakes that people make in their experience. Mm. But I've also got a couple cool strategies in there and a couple tools. There's a tool called the Customer Persona Creator Wizard that's in that that you can download and it helps walk you through creating all those personas. So it's a great download. I really suggest that you grab this and just you know, spend some time looking at your business and thinking about it from that customer's point of view. And this download will really give you a hand. It, you can get it at go.cxformula.com slash M-Y-B. Awesome. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. Really quick, Jason, is there anything else that you feel you want to share or you feel that's missing in order to make this episode complete? No, I think this has been great. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak with you, James and Phoebe. And, you know, the most important thing out there is to love our customers and to take good care of them. So I hope everyone got some value from this and really makes an effort to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Are you frustrated that no matter how hard you hustle, no matter how much you get done in a day, you still feel like you have little results to show for it? Do you feel like you're doing everything right, but there's still something missing? Well, what if there was an easier way? What if your business could be fun, effortless, and profitable? Phoebe and I have put together a free audio MP3 for you, compiling the 77 business affirmations for creating success from the inside out. And we want to give it to you absolutely free. This is your chance to rewire your brain for bigger results in your life and your business. To get instant access absolutely free, simply visit 77affirmations.com. That's the number 77affirmations.com.